Okay, everyone, thank you for tuning in. I'm just about to start the presentation. I'll um, share my screen now and we will get started. So um, thank you all for tuning in uh, this evening and um, offering some of your valuable time to learn about nest box monitoring um, across the Macedon Ranges and also on your property. Um, I'll just listen. So before I um, start the presentation proper, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we uh, live and work. I am zooming in from the uh, Jaja Warang clan um, area, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging of this area. And also, um, acknowledge um, any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be viewing this presentation either tonight or in the future during the recording. So why nest boxes? Why, why do we even need them? Well, I'm sure most of you tuning in are well aware that um, Australian wildlife is Pretty unique, I think, in just its complete and total reliance on nest on um, hollows. Um, hollows in the Australian environment, um, they're not, it's a bit different to uh, North America and other parts of the world where uh, hollows can be formed by, let's say, woodpeckers um, making um, uh, cavities in trees here um, in Australia. We have hollow formation that forms in eucalypts when a, um, uh, like maybe a branch will break off and then there'll be um, some fungal attack or something like that. And it's a natural process, but it takes a really long time. Having said that, there are just so many animals that are um, reliant on hollows and it's over 300 species. And that's not just birds, that's uh, birds, uh, mammals, um, and all sorts of um, even reptiles, things like lace monitors and the like. Uh, the hollow that you see here is, is absolutely huge and um, would have taken hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to form. Uh, it looks like a really good hollow, but it actually, um, it's got a really large entrance, which means that it um, can have access um, by predators, um, such as the lace monitor that I mentioned before. But yeah, they're a vi vital habitat, and they're used um, for not just um, breeding in, they're also used for roosting, which is another um, word for uh, I guess resting um, when they when they're not breeding and also uh, for shelter like for example um, if you're familiar with the white-throated tree creeper this is a small bird that uh, is aptly named and it creeps up and down the trees and um, they uh, sleep inside the big uh, hollowed out areas of large old trees um, on the inside just clinging with their feet there so um, yeah really vitally important. Um, one of the reasons that's a bit pressing at the moment for nest boxes is that we of course had those huge storms that occurred um, back in June 2021 and uh, this is a photo of the wombat forest mm -hmm. some of the Pardon? No? Um, that's, this is a photo of some of the storm damage that occurred um, in the Wombat Forest. And I know, for example, just on um, um, in Hanging Rock, our um, reserves officer who works there, the ranger there, um, Simon, he was telling us that um, some 60 trees have been lost, really large hollow bearing trees from the side of um, of hanging rock and that's even after um, well after the storms you know what I mean um, so there's been tree fall from the um, all the rain that we've had as well and so many of those trees are actually hollow bearing trees but it's not just um, of course uh, storms it's also um, because Hollows, um, hollow bearing trees are um, removed for urban development. 
and um, they also get um, destroyed when um, even um, a very delicate planned burn that's been undertaken, uh, if they don't uh, rake around the trees, then the um, fire can actually destroy the hollow in, in the trees, um, just from a, from even from a cool burn. Um, the picture that you see now is of a gang gang cockatoo, which is one of the hollow using parrots. And um, they were only recently listed as endangered last year. Um, the loss of hollows is classified as a key threatening process to biodiversity throughout Australia. So nest boxes can provide some pretty vital habitat that is um, currently in short supply across the landscape. So I'll just go through now um, some of the species that use hollows. Um, we've got the powerful owl. Uh, here we have a photograph of a chick. So that's a very big chick that's um, nearly fledged. It's about 60 centimetres in height. And uh, the powerful owl is one of the indicator species of the um, for the Macedon Ranges area. And they need massive hollows, really big hollows. Sometimes they have two chicks. And this chick, just to give you an idea, is about 60 centimetres in height, which is big. And the owl, that's the same size as the adult owls. It's one of the largest owls in the world. Also, um, possums and gliders. So we've got the common brush-tailed possum here and the sugar glider, which is now also uh, known as the crefts glider. This was because they worked out that there were a few different species of sugar gliders. Um, so these, um, these <laughs> animals shelter in hollows and um, they often, um, well, the sugar gliders um, are in little colonies. Um, and the name common brush-tailed possum is a bit of a misnomer because they're actually um, reduced in range in our natural um, areas. Like they're, they're increased in the urban area, but um, out in the forests, because of this lack of hollows, there's a less around. So great hollow that you can see there. <clears throat> there's also uh, birds. Um, so you can see here from this sacred kingfisher that the hollow entrance is very, very tight. Um, it's just big enough for it to squeeze in. Um, and that, that's a, a, a characteristic of a, a pretty good hollow. Um, keeps the rain out and also the predators. Um, this um, mm -hmm. Helen, <laughs> Helen Hello. is here. Hello, uh, Helen. Hello. Um, is, um, yeah, she's uh, one of uh, one of our regular attendees at these biodiversity monitoring events. And Helen actually photographed this amazing uh, bird, surely Hello. one of the cutest in Australia. It's a um, Australian owl at nightjar, and these little birds will come out and sun themselves on a sunny day and that's exactly what it's doing here and um, owl at night jars use many different hollows um, in their habitat and so if you have these present it means that the, there's a, a, a quite an abundance of small hollows available these are quite small birds they're almost would you say Helen about a rosella size or something um Yes, probably, or a little bit bigger. Yeah, a little bit bigger. Yeah, they're um, quite small for a nocturnal bird. Very cute. Um, also bats. So um, this is a lesser long-eared bat, and um, we have an amazing and diverse bat fauna in Australia. And uh, these little guys, um, they use very small hollows to rest in um, uh, or roost in but they need larger hollows for what's called maternity colonies. So you'll get uh, dozens of the females all roosting together and raising their young in these hollows, and they provide a really um, vital resource of very cute little bats. We have lots of different bats. So I've got the picture of the lesser long-eared here because, um, yeah, they're a bat that's quite often um, seen in people's houses um, accidentally because they do tend to... Um, use roof spaces as well. 
So now we come to the star of our Nestbox uh, monitoring program, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these animals for, for, for a while, um, seeing as they're so important, and they're the reason that the Macedon Ranges has a Nestbox program. Um, so the brush-tailed facile girl is a desi urid, which is the name of the family of carnivorous marsupials. So they're like um, in the same family as a quoll or a Tasmanian devil, but they are much smaller in size. And they're very distinctive in that they have that bright and bushy brush tail. Um, they are listed as vulnerable under the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act. And uh, looking a little bit about their life history, they um, they range over a really large uh, area. So the females is 20 to 70 hectares and the males will range over 100 hectares. That's a really, really long, um, really large area to cover, covering all sorts of different habitats, I imagine, and also different uh, areas. Some are cleared and some are natural as well. Um, so they'll nest in um, as many as uh, 30 different sites each year. They change uh, their roosting areas depending on whether they're breeding or not. Um, and also depending on where there's more food availability across those really large home ranges. Um, so their nests can be in hollows in dead or live trees or in tree stumps. And um, the nursery nests, a little bit like the, um, the bats that I was talking about before, they need a large, secure area in which to raise their young. Fantastic photos by my predecessor, William Terry, who uh, did such a, a great job of um, photographing these wonderful creatures. He's a, a really good photographer. Um, so... Why, why do we select the brush-tailed fastest girl as a biodiversity indicator? Well, they, if, if they're persisting in an area, that means that there's abundant food available in, in that area that you're, that you're managing or looking after, whether that be um, a reserve or a roadside or your own property. Um, they are quite fierce little predators and they need large moths, spiders, centipedes. Um, and what um, the, their presence shows that there's um, a connectivity across the landscape. So we talk a lot about connectivity when we talk about biodiversity. And what that means is, is that the animals can move around from population to uh, area to area in, in such a way that the populations are able to mix genetically, they're able to interbreed. It means that the, when the young are born and it's time for them to leave their home range, they can disperse or move to other areas if there isn't enough connected habitat or habitat that's suitable for the brush-tail facile girl to move through, then they end up becoming isolated. They end up, um, uh, it's, it's called the island, islandization effect where you have um, a population of animals and it's surrounded by unsuitable land, like maybe heavily cropped farmland or um, land that's been very much developed. Um, the other thing that the Vasca girl um, reveals by its presence is that there's plenty of these hollows and nursery nests that um, are around. And also um, they are a really good indicator that there's lots of coarse woody debris, which is like the uh, scientific term for just lots and lots of branches and logs all over the ground. They use these branches and logs to scurry around um, their habitat um, to hunt and um, also it's this coarse woody debris that provides the habitat for all the animals and invertebrates that they're preying upon. The photo here is a uh, camera trap image of a brush-tailed fasca girl in the cobors, which is a um, an area of large, um, pretty pretty 
a good quality habitat that um, has all of the features that brush tail fassa girls require. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's a definitely a significant landscape there and uh, one, one worth um, protecting. So I just pulled this out of the biodiversity strategy. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a table that um, it pulls out one of the objectives of the biodiversity strategy, which was um, developed um, through quite an extensive community consultation project back in 2018. And what it does is it guides us of why we want to monitor. Why do we want to measure the extent of a number of brush-tailed fossil girls um, across the landscape? And it's because we've got a monitoring question. So the, the question is what changes are occurring across the Macedon Ranges landscape? And we want to e monitor ecosystem health. And one of the ways that we do that is by using indicator species. And you can see here that in the plan, these um, various species were selected as indicator species. And the brush-tailed fasciguel is there. And I've talked a little bit about how the brush-tailed fasciguel gives us an idea of the habitat quality. There's also these other um, um, species, the powerful owl and the greater glider and the woodland birds. So the powerful owl, um, one of the ways it's quite, it's a little bit harder to monitor powerful owls because they have home ranges that are even larger. Um, so they'll range across all sorts of habitats up to oh, 1,000 to 5,000 hectares. And so um, if you're looking at monitoring an animal to look at the um, um, the management of an area, in, in some ways it's better to monitor the uh, animals that the powerful owl is preying upon, if that makes sense. And so it's kind of good that when we've put up these brush tail fascigale boxes, a lot of them are actually um, occupied by um, uh, sugar gliders, which are a uh, prey species for powerful owl. We also um, do spotlight monitoring or spot, uh, spotlighting, uh, which some of you have attended. Um, we'll be doing that again in April. And that also enables us to look at and measure the numbers of uh, common ringtail uh, possums, which are also a prey species for the powerful owl. Um, we've got greater glider there as well. They are definitely a rare species in the Macedon Ranges and extensive um, surveys only revealed them to be over in the kind of wombat forest east parts of, of the Macedon Ranges. And then woodland birds we look at um, and other rare birds we look at during our um, Macedon Ranges bird blitz, which um, we undertake in October. Um, so that's kind of our rationale. And if you have nest boxes on your property, it's a good idea to think about, okay, why, why are you monitoring your nest boxes? Do you have a plan to, um, just determine what kind of species are on your property, or perhaps um, you've done some revegetation works and you could, uh, measure the numbers and, a diversity of species in your nest boxes over time as your revegetation grows. And I think that can be an aim for a land care group that's undertaking some kind of um, biodiversity restoration activities um, or a friends group who's working in reserves. And I know some of our friends groups have some really excellent um, nest box monitoring programs. So just to talk a little bit about the um, nest box monitoring that we do and how we selected the site. So it was quite a rigorous um, process and we have these um, uh, different um, um, areas there that are sort of like core habitat areas. There's the um, Upper Coliban, Riddles Hill, uh, hills, chitin woodlands, cobors, and um, and so on, um, going to all the way over to the Mount William range. 
And um, the biodiversity monitoring sites were set up. Uh, they're the block, black dots that you can see there. They were set up um, as um, sites to monitor uh, the nest boxes, so the um, brush tail fascigale, but also um, some of the sites. Um, so some of the sites are for nest box monitoring, but there's um, a lot are also for uh, bird monitoring um, and spotlighting as well. Um, so we wanted to look at when we've got quite a few sites. And so these sites were set up in such a way that in the future, um, they can be analyzed um, statistically by, let's say, an honor student or um, um, a, um, other kind of um, volunteer or interested person who's interested in the scientific analysis of the results. Um, so we've set them up so that we can look at um, whether or not brush tail fascigales are occurring just in the larger habitat, or are they occurring um, in what's called um, connecting vegetation? Are they just on the roadsides that are linking these larger habitat patches? And then we've um, gone down in, even into finer detail. Um, are the fascigales mainly in the dry areas or, um, or are they in the wetter areas or both? Um, are sugar gliders more likely to be in the gullies and creeks? And so it's it's been set up in a way that there could be a few different scientific questions that can be answered by um, the collection of this data, which is quite exciting. Um, so some of the initial um, results, uh, you can see here the different species that have been recorded. And you can see there's such a, a variety, um, such a variation between the biolink areas of what species have been recorded in what area. And um, you can see Kyneton Woodlands is very popular with sugar gliders. Um, I'm really interested by the Riddle Hills um, lack of um, nest box occupancy. Um, but sometimes nest box occupancy is, um, there's not as much ne nest box occupancy, uh, not because animals aren't there, but because there's already a, an abundant hollow resource available. So um, more monitoring and investigation is definitely warranted for these areas. The other thing that we can do is compare our spotlight monitoring results with nest box occupancy. So if we go to Riddle Hills and we see um, in our spotlighting that we're seeing all three species, then maybe my hypothesis that there is um, there are abundant hollows available um, will hold water. So yes, it's uh, it's a, it's a fascinating fascinating question and and you can look at this kind of stuff on your property as well um so data so data in order or in order to um answer our our um questions and also um yeah i guess contribute to um the knowledge of biodiversity in in victoria we um have a um a, a commitment to upload our data to the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas. So this is a um, state government um, database. Um, it's a biodiversity data repository. It's a little clunky to use. Um, it's not very user-friendly, um, but the best thing about it is it's the data that the land managers um, at DELP or DECA, they actually use this Victorian Biodiversity Atlas um, first and above any other database. So they don't go on the Atlas of Living Australia so much or um, iNaturalist. Um, they use this biodiversity atlas and um, then that informs um, any management questions they have around um, deciding about um, logging um, or prescribed burns and the like. Um, because the, the monitoring we're doing is on council land and in council reserves, we are the, the biodiversity manager, not, not, um, not DELP. Um, However, I think it's great to be able to share the data and then if then our data can complement any monitoring um, questions or scientific studies that they're doing. Um, 
so what kind of data do, does one record, um, whether you're um, a landholder or whether you're someone like me who's managing quite a big program? So um, Nestbox monitoring has really taken off in the last 15 years around Victoria. So the Arthur Ryla Institute, um, which is like the research arm of, of um, DELP or DECA, they analysed um, all of the different nest box monitoring that was occurring around the state and came up with a series of fact sheets. I've just done a screen grab of one of them here. And um, they basically reported um, what was happening, what people are doing, what's the best practice. And this fact sheet here is on monitoring and storing data and what they've done is um, um, describe um, best practice for um, people to use. And the, the main thing is, is that you need information about the nest boxes themselves, the, the type of uh, box that you're putting up, um, the tree that it's on. And this is called metadata because it's data about data. Um, and then, um, so that forms one spreadsheet. And then you have another spreadsheet, which is uh, used for your nest box checks. And then this has the information that's updated as each, each check as a result of your monitoring activities. Um, and I'll go into that kind of um, information um, in the next slides. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about Nestbox installation for those of you um, who um, have nest boxes um, or um, intending on um, putting up nest boxes. Um, so you'd want to install them on large native trees um, on or close to the main trunk. And one of the little rule of thumbs is that if you're wanting to uh, put up nest boxes for arboreal mammals such as sugar gliders and and um, brush tail fascigal, you have the um, the entry hole orientated so that it's near the back but um, with birds you can have them facing out um, rough bark trees um, is great for fascigals um, you don't want the animals to cook. Um, well, no, it's hard to imagine and or remember what it's like with a hot summer, but it does happen um, where we have those heat waves, which are very um, debilitating to animals. Um, and so, yeah, you want to face south or southeast and you want them high enough um, so they're safe for predators, but there's a little bit of a... Um, uh, you've got to juggle because you want it as high as you can, but you also want to be able to reach the nest box um, for maintenance and for monitoring safely. I just, um, I don't really recommend putting up powerful owl nest boxes because they're so huge. You can see here, this is so, it's such a huge nest box. This is by Miles Gildard, the man in the middle there who um, has a, um, a nest box making company. And, yeah, you need you need you need a contractor to um, safely install that nest box. That's for sure. Um, uh, maintaining your nest box, um, and this is the kind of stuff that I've got to do as well with maintaining council's nest boxes. Um, you've got to look at all the things you you can set and forget with nest boxes, but ideally, um, it's best not to. It's really best to check nest boxes. Um, at least annually. Uh, there's general um, things that can happen. There's bees, um, ants, you can have introduced birds, um, and then also uh, general wear and tear. Um, it depends on the quality of your nest box and um, it's um, really advisable to um, have your nest box um, nicely painted. Uh, with an external, a good exterior grade paint that's uh, non-toxic, just to help with the weather um, and um, any of that kind of uh, wear and tear can also happen um, with depending on how you've affixed your nest box to the tree. So when we do our nest box checks, we're also checking whether or not the nest box is in um, um, good repair and making a note as to whether or not we need to replace or repair that nest box. 
So here we get to the inspection, okay? So, and when to do it. Um, so I've been contacted recently. A primary school wanted um, a request that, that I come out and um, uh, monitor the nest boxes at their school um, twice a month. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's just too much. It's too much disturbance to the animal. Um, so yeah, you, you really want to keep it at a minimum because they are regarding the nest box as a safe place, safe from predators. And um, you checking the nest box is a, um, yeah, can be quite disturbing to them. There are, having said that, good times, um, better times than others at when to check the nest boxes. So um, we do our nest box check um, in autumn. March to May. Um, this is when um, Fasca girls are active and looking for breeding partners, um, which means that they're not in, in the nest box with young. Um, it's also a good time if you have bird nest boxes because the birds have finished breeding. It's a lovely photo here by Jess Lawton, who is the nest box monitoring coordinator at Connecting Country in the Castlemaine area. Um, so what kind of things might you see in your nest box or might we see when we go out nest box monitoring with the council boxes? Well, it's quite easy um, to tell the difference between a brush tail fascigale nest and a sugar glider nest. This is a really typical and classic um, brush tail fascigale uh, nest because it's got feathers. They seem to really like feathers and it's messy. It's got all sorts of different materials. Um, one <laughs> Jess that I spoke about before, uh, she mentioned that, that some, <laughs> someone had left a pair of underpants in the in the bush and they were actually uh the brush tail fasca girl had uh brought them into the nest box and was using that so yeah that's a bit of an unusual one and also i think there was one whole uh dead bird that they brought in as well um so you want to record what kind of nest you're seeing um but you're also looking for scats and scats are really um, obvious of the brush tail fascicle there. Um, you can see them on my right. Um, they're the um, kind of shiny cylindrical scats there. And they are, um, they're shiny because of all the insects that the brush tail fascicles eat. So they're, that's the insect exoskeleton. And um, yeah, they're often just shoved in, in the corner of the nest box. Um, whereas a, oh, sorry, a sugar glider nest box is very, very neat. So sometimes you can see the sugar gliders as in this photo, but in other times, all you can see is this very, very beautiful, beautifully arranged um, spherical nest of the uh, brush to, uh, of the of eucalyptus leaves that are quite fresh, and um, they they're arranged in this really lovely artistic way. And um, sometimes they're completely enclosed by the nest, and sometimes they're not. And the green is a is a good indicator that it's a fresh nest. Um, sometimes you get the a phenomenon where you have an old sugar glider nest and then the fusca gale has just moved in on top. And I suspect actually that's what's happened with um, possibly with this one because of the big layers of um, um, kind of finely arranged um, eucalyptus leaves up in the corner there. So that's what we mark. We we mark where the, uh, there's scats, and sometimes um, in a nest box um, that's occupied by brush tail fascia girls, there'll be no nest at all. There'll just be a lot of uh, fascia girl droppings. So we'll make sure we note that. Um, so the other um, thing about the monitoring is that you you don't have to climb a ladder and look inside physically there's other ways to do it um, these days um, one of them which I don't know how many people do it um, but it, it it would be fun to try especially if you've if you've got kids um, 
it's it's a, a bit of a variation on what's called stag watching. So a stag is a large dead old tree and um, you position yourself um, before um, twilight and you actually just wait and see what comes out. And this lovely illustration from the Connecting Country Nestbox Monitoring Guide shows um, that if you're by yourself and very quiet, you can set yourself up really quite close to your nest box and just wait and see what comes out. Um, whereas if there's a group of you just a little bit further away, <laughs> um, um, just to reduce um, the uh, any disturbance to, to the animal, the um the other um new thing that is really great and this is the way we do it when we go out on the council nest box checks is use a pole inspection camera so i've got one here this is um it's it's kind of like a a long um tube with a light in the end and you fit this um on the end of a big long inspection pole and then you use a, a monitor, the monitor um, that enables you to um, see what's inside um, the, the the nest box, which is fantastic. It's a really um, all it is was all the animal will see is just a, a strange thing coming in, and a little bit of a light, and then you can quickly uh, have a look and uh, see what's in there, and then record your data. And you can even um, take um, like a screenshot and record photos of the uh, nest box occupants. Um, and um, there's a third option as well. You can actually set up wildlife cameras on an opposite uh, tree to take photos of the inhabitants as they come and go. And uh, there's, a, um, there's a really great uh, resource um, called Nest Box Tales, um, which has really comprehensive information on uh, wildlife cameras and setting them up and using wildlife cameras as a way to monitor your nest box and their comings and goings and whether they're occupied or not. So yeah, that's great. We've actually got, um, we have wildlife cameras at council um, for people to borrow if, if they would like to have a go. Um, so in terms of, so for, for us, um, I've got, we've got our data monitoring sheet and then we've got um, an Excel spreadsheet and then that gets sent to the Biodiversity Atlas as I was talking about before. Um, but when you're thinking about monitoring your nest boxes on your property, um, there's other things that you can do. You can try using um, iNaturalist Australia and you can just um, record your data there. Um, one of the uh, friends groups locally, Friends of Black Hill, are using an app called Avenza. And Avenza is amazing because you can create a, um, um, it's almost like a geolocated PDF that you use a map of, of the reserve that you're monitoring and then you link an Excel spreadsheet to um, various points on the map where the nest boxes are and then you enter the data in that way and I, I believe that's a similar um, technique um, um, the way that um, the Atlas of Living Australia uh, BioCollect um, is used. Both of those things have uh, capacity to have an app on your smartphone um, as well as um, desktop. So who knows? At the moment, we're just using traditional, we're going, we're just doing Excel, but we might end up um, graduating to these more um, modern online kind of um, um, formats and, and platforms, which, which is exciting. Um, and um, yeah, let us know, or if you've got any questions, you know, um, uh, I'd love to hear about what kind of monitoring you're doing uh, or anything that you've seen. Um, and yes, so um, part of the, when I was advertising this nest box monitoring webinar, I was interested in finding out if anyone wanted to come along and um, because 
you know, I need one person um, for OHS, and sometimes it's a council staff member, and sometimes it's some um, someone from the community, or a um, maybe uh, I've got a, a chap who's um, uh, finished. Um, uh, doing a land management course and is looking for voluntary experience um, in, in the field. Um, but I also really welcome uh, community members because um, we, you know, we can, all four of us can go out, we can have, um, I can have three volunteers. So I'll be doing it for the whole um, uh, month of March. I'm actually going out tomorrow myself and Josh. I'll probably just do that one, just him and I, but then um, we'll be going out at least twice a week for the rest of March if people are interested. Um, and because we're <clears throat> still in the old fashioned way of uh, we need to do data entry. Um, so office based volunteers for data entry are also very welcome. Uh, definitely uh, won't say no to that. Um, so that ends my presentation. I'm going to um, stop sharing now. And I'll just um, I'll just I might uh, pause the record. I might stop the recording there. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, yeah.